this uh, segment will not be so easy for me. I'm doing it uh, from my mother's yard site, which is Chai Oder. As I've mentioned before, I was all of 16. And, uh, and it ain't easy. But I want to tell you something about her. She, as I've said many times, she was the daughter of Remendel Schneerson, who was the son of Reb Levi Yitzchak Schneerson, the son of Reb Baruch Sholem, who's the son of the Tzamech Tzedek. Those of you who are Lubavitch know what I'm talking about. And those of you who aren't, this is we, where we and all of you connect up and, and everybody, all the Chzidit. Tzamech Tzedek had seven sons. They went in different directions and everybody intermarried, intermarried. For instance, I'm related to the of Boba Viren, I'm related to the Satmiran, because we're all in, this is where we all connect. So we're grandchildren of the oldest son of the Tzemach Tzedek, as is the Rebbe. But that's not what I want to talk about. And by the way, um, if there are, um, if I make a mistake in a date or in a time, and uh, you could you could write in on COL, I'm happy to see that the correction, because I don't want other people to also not know the exact. Uh, this is the story as I know it. In 1937, my uncle, Reb Zalman Schneerson, Reb Schneer Zalman Schneerson, was sent to Paris by the Freire de Kereb. He arrived in Paris not really knowing why he came. And then, uh, you know, the Vichy government and uh, the Germans just walked in they walked down the Champs-Élysées by the Arc de Triomphe like they owned the place. And my Fetter Zalman understood what he was doing there. The story in our family is that he took nine trucks of children and sperm and he ran to the south of France to save these kids. Do you know that at the end of the war, he found homes and family for a lot of those children, the parents survived. He went himself with them to Israel to look for family. I remember what a simcha it was each time. He was an incredible gentleman. He was an incredible man. To finance those nine trucks, he needed money. He needed to run. And so he borrowed money from many places. Of course, hoping he would repay as soon as the war is over. A few years ago, I think 10 years ago, my cousin Hadassah Karlbach, Schneers and Karlbach, and my brother Shalom Beren, and some other people under Rabbi Krasniansky, I think, went back to all those places where the children hid, and they still found my uncle's handwriting. Sometimes they were in hotels, so his handwriting on the, the registration in the hotel. Sometimes they were in forests. He saved hundreds of children. Today, it's... By now, it's thousands of families. Now, we came to Paris in 1947, and right after the war, my uncle, Reb Zalman, after he found, he had a kinderheim to keep the children till after the war so he could find their parents and he could find their families. And then he went to America so he could raise the money to repay all those thousands of francs or whatever it was that he borrowed in whatever denomination he borrowed, to bring back, he went to America to raise money. In his house at Disrudieu, I talked about it, that Evertsen was there and that Ever was there, uh, Place de, near Place de la République in, in Paris. I was just there. It's incredible, incredible part of my visit. Uh, in this house was my aunt Sora, his wife, Rebbe Tzachana came there also, and um, they left. The Rebbe and the Rebbe Tzun left after Shavuos. We remained, and I can't tell you times, but it had to be two, three years later, because I remember this, and 1947, I don't remember well. I was only two. Now, you know I'm not 27. One day, there was a knock on the door, and two people came in, with long yellow papers. 
and they started to write down all the things we have in our house. They were going to sell everything so that we could repay the people that Fetr Zalman owed money to. Ah, let me describe what we had. In our dining room, there was a round wooden table, round wooden table, imagine the size of the room. I think it was, you know, when I was a little girl, it seems to me that it sat 24 people, but I'm sure my brothers and sister will correct me later, yeah. I think it was 24 chairs, leather chairs with nails on the side, this high. You know what that thing would cost today with nails on the side? Totally leather chairs around this incredible table. Imagine the size of the room. They came, they wrote down that table. They wrote down that table. They wrote down those chairs. They even wrote down the tablecloths, I think. Whatever balabatishkeit my mother had, not everything was Fetr Zalman's, but everything went into that Rishima. I remember we had a radio with little green lights that went around, round, round, round. I was a little girl. That was fascinating to me. That when they counted, when the United Nations was counting the votes for Eretz Yisrael, everybody was sitting around that radio. They took that too. They took everything. They wrote everything down. They came back a few days later, and everything was taken. Somehow, my mother saved, hid, I don't know, I was a little girl. A bedspread that she had, a silk bedspread with long fringes, silk fringes. My brother, Rabbi Shmuel Butman, and I were taken to 49 Rubisha. I was just there too and cried in front of that building. That's where Anash Chabad was living and they took us there to our friends so we shouldn't be there when they take away when they carry out our things from the house. In the evening, Shalomber, my brother who lives in Erzisroel, came to pick us up. I remember crossing the bridge. There was a bridge between Rubisha and Rudieu. I remember crossing the bridge, and I think there were more tears coming down from my eyes than there was water in the canal in Paris. And I walked home shaking. I was a little girl. I was so scared to see what I would see. I walked home shaking and crying and holding on to Shalom Bed for dear life. And we came into the house and we walked up the steps. By the way, when the Freya de Kereva came there, he counted every step. And he said, Kiminya Navaya. The steps were exactly 26 steps to go up. When we opened up, there were big, I don't know if you know Parisian apartments, big wooden doors, big wooden doors to the apartment and the doors opened. That room with the big round table with the big chairs had a rickety card table. I don't know if it had all four legs. On it was my mother's bedspread. On it was a broken vase with flowers in it, standing next to it was Imi Meirossi. And at that moment, the Meirossi is bigger than anything else. Because if there is a lesson that she taught me from my life, that was that moment. Imi Meirossi was standing, talk about body language, with her hands like this, tight, her shoulders straight, her head as high as possible, saying to us, I don't remember if those were the words, but that's what she said with everything. Furniture doesn't make the home, kinderlach. A table and 24 chairs doesn't make the home, kinderlach. Nit mebel machen aheim. Furniture doesn't make the home. Mishpoche is what's important. Our family, and we're intact. We're here. It's not the beautiful table. It's not the chairs. It's not the gorgeous dishes. It's not the silver. It's not whatever it is that they took away. We are here, and we will be here, 
and we will be together and we will make it. Thank you, Ma. I live with that all my life. We will make it. We'll be okay. We just have to do the right thing. So Babir Chas Moshiach now. I can't be any more Babir Chas Moshiach now than that. Zayt gesund. And thank you for sharing this personal moment with me. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim.